Hello, I'm Aminta Dawson with the ACES staff. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Centering Relationality in Indigenous Knowledge Organization, sponsored by DCMI. Our distinguished presenter is Dr. Sandy Littletree, who will be introduced by our moderator, Karen Wickett, an assistant professor in the School of Information Sciences at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and she leads webinar organization for the DCMI Education Committee. I'd like to ask the audience to type your questions into the question panel box and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. I will now turn this session over to Karen Wickett who will introduce our presenter. Hello, thank you everyone for joining us today for this Dublin Core webinar. Uh, we have today Dr. Sandy Littletree. Sandy Littletree is an assistant teaching professor at the University of Washington's Information School. She is Eastern Shoshone and is a citizen of the Navajo Nation, a member of the research group known as iNative and part of the Native North American Indigenous Knowledge Initiative at the UWI School. Dr. Littletree's interests lie at the intersections of indigenous systems of knowledge and librarianship. Dr. Littletree is an elected member of the IFLA Indigenous Matters Standing Committee and sits on several national and international advisory boards focused on indigenous librarianship. She's past president of the American Indian Library Association, and she was program manager of the Knowledge River program at the University of Arizona, where she focused on recruiting and retaining Native American and Latino MLIS students. So thank you so much for joining us today, Sandy. Uh, so um, we will do a, uh, your presentation for about 40 minutes uh, or 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so as Aminta said, if folks have questions, please go ahead and type them into the chat, and uh, we will go through those at the end of the presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. Take it away. All right, well, thank you. Um, hello, welcome everyone. Yat A. I hope everyone who's listening to my words right now is feeling well and doing well. Thank you for taking time to be with me today. Uh, I want to thank um, Karen Wickett and the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative Education Committee for this invitation to share my work with you today. It's a real honor to be invited to give this talk. Today I'm going to share with you a framework that I co-developed with my research group a framework that centers relationality in its understanding of indigenous systems of knowledge. Uh, but before I share this framework, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself, where I'm located geographically, and some background information on how we came to this framework. Um, I've shared this framework with um, audiences um, in the past couple of years, um, and I always am surprised in ways that it resonates with people um, and their work. So I'm looking forward to having conversations with you at the conclusion of this talk about um, your questions and how you see this relevant in your work. So I'm coming to you from my home located on Stechas, one of the traditional territories of the Squaxin Island people the people of the seven inlets of the southernmost part of the Puget Sound here in the Pacific Northwest. Nearby to me are the Nisqually, the Skokomish, Chehalis, the Puyallup, along with several other Coast Salish tribal communities. So what you're looking at here on my screen is a map of Western Washington tribes and treaty lands, a map created by Evergreen State College faculty member Zoltan Grossman. The arrow on the left is pointing to Olympia, Washington, where I am today, and on the right is pointing to Seattle for your reference. Here in Western Washington, we're surrounded by Coast Salish tribes, including many generations of engagement with the water and waterways, with salmon and trees and traditional foods and medicines. And we're also surrounded by a recent history of treaties, dams, ongoing negotiations with water and land use that impacts all of us. I start my presentation in this way to acknowledge the land, the water, and the people who have lived here for generations. As a Navajo woman working and living in Coast Salish territories, I'm a guest here. 
I work to be a respectful visitor here, knowing that I have a lifetime of learning the history, cultures, and community connections uh, here in Washington. The land where I am currently located is quite different from the land of, um, uh, to the land of my ancestors. Uh, pictured here on the left is uh, Shiprock, New Mexico. Um, on my homelands where I was raised. And on the right are the waters of the Puget Sound. I was raised near this landmark that we call Shiprock um, in the Northwest part of New Mexico, where most of my immediate family and relatives from my dad's side are, um, still reside. My mom's relatives are primarily uh, based on and near the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. I'm Eastern Shoshone from my mom's side, and I'm an enrolled citizen of the Navajo Nation from my dad's side. I acknowledge my connections to multiple indigenous communities from my own heritage and from the places that I've lived and, um, and from the places that I live. And as I acknowledge these multiple communities, I also acknowledge the multiple landscapes, histories, and cultures. Some of these connections and experiences overlap, while others exist in distinct spaces of land, history, and culture. Both the overlaps of experiences and the distinct spaces inform my scholarship, and I build on all of these with purpose and intent. Before I go on, I want to um, make sure I just see, uh, can everyone, everyone can see my slides, is that right? Yes, yeah, we see your slides. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, like a lot of Native people of my generation, my connection to my ancestral languages and knowledge has been limited due to colonization. So I enter into my work with deep personal connections and motivations to understand how colonization has impacted me, my family, and others like us and to understand how knowledge and information continues to flow in our communities alongside the legacies of colonization and the histories of self-determination and tribal sovereignty. So as a researcher, I'm interested in how Western institutions such as libraries, archives, and institutions of higher education either continue these legacies of colonization by maintaining the status quo or try to mitigate the harms done to indigenous communities by acknowledging the impacts of colonization and making spaces for indigenous perspectives. I believe that we're at a critical moment of acknowledging those impacts of colonization and then moving into processes that center indigenous people in the creation of technology and information systems. If you aren't familiar with the images on the screen, on the left is the iconic American Progress image from 1872, depicting progress as a white European woman holding a book and telegraph wires while she and pioneers move west to settle the frontier, displacing Native people off to the margins. On the right is a meme from Native social media uh, responding to the image of a, a CNN exit poll from election night 2020, where Native people were indirectly called something else as their racial identity. When Native people came out in historic numbers to vote in 2020, this meme directly responds to the tendency to erase Native people as something else. There's an ongoing need to overcome these impacts of colonization as it rears itself in strange ways every day. And there's a need to define ourselves in our institutions because there's a lot of work ahead of us. And I want to acknowledge uh, Marisa Duarte's work for alerting me to this um, interpretation of uh, American, the American progress image. What I'm about to share is based on years of conversations in our research group at the University of Washington. Our research group, previously known as uh, the Indigenous Information Research Group, or ERG for short, uh, now known as iNative, under the mentorship and advisement of Dr. Cheryl Matoyer at the University of Washington's Information School, 
We focus our work on relationality and the co-creation research model of community engagement. Uh, Dr. Matoyer introduced the elements of Native American philosophy to us using the circle as a framework. Um, and she created spaces for us to discuss relationality, order, balance, and stories as important elements for our research at the iSchool. So I wanna acknowledge Dr. Matoyer's influence on this work and all the conversations that we had in our research group, as well as with indigenous scholars that helped us with this model. Collectively, our research group has been investigating and talking about um, how indigenous ways of knowing can inform protocols to name, articulate, collate, make accessible, and understand the objects and materials that indicate indigenous knowledge in our institutions. Although we're coming from different tribal communities, our research group finds solidarity in the concept of relationality, which became the center of a framework um, that a few of us wrote about um, in this recent article. My main contribution to this work, I feel, was um, putting these ideas into the circles to visually depict the conceptual framework and calling my colleagues, um, Drs. Marisa Duarte and Miranda Bellardi Lewis together to help me write about this framework. The full citation is listed here, um, as well as a preview of the framework that we developed. And I'm going to walk us through the framework in a moment. Before I do that, I wanna tell you a little bit about what's informing my approach. I'm interested in the intersections of indigenous ways of knowing and the information science field I study information institutions that build indigenous perspectives into their spaces, policies, collections, programs, and systems. This includes native run libraries like tribal libraries and archives, First Nations libraries, uh, tribal college libraries, but also non-native libraries, archives, and data repositories that hold indigenous collections. Examining the intersections of two knowledge systems, indigenous knowledge and Western libraries, reveals some mismatches in philosophies, values, and practices. Torres Strait Islander scholar Dr. Martin Nakata calls this the cultural interface, that contested space between two knowledge systems. It's a space of constraints as well as possibilities Viewing this information issue through the lens of the cultural interface reveals why some, not all native people, um, may not have a strong connection to libraries, archives, or other systems designed to preserve knowledge, why some people distrust these institutions, why some are skeptical of not only what these institutions hold about native topics and knowledge, but why these institutions have these collections in the first place, as well as why they've been organized, categorized, and labeled in certain ways. It also gives us a space to talk about the possibilities of improving the systems to benefit Native people. In my work, I rely on the term Indigenous librarianship, um, which has emerged in the scholarly literature over the past 12 years. The seminal work of Burns, Doyle, Joseph, and Krebs in 2010 mapped the landscape of indigenous librarianship for those of us researching in this area. Some of the key areas of research identified by these authors included, includes native indigenous approaches to digitization, local and national information policy, cultural and intellectual property rights, knowledge organization, and professional ethics. They identify a need to develop theoretical frameworks uh, within uh, library and information science and assert that scholarship of indigenous librarianship has important contributions to make to the library and information science discipline, reminding us that indigenous librarianship has, quote, the potential to mobilize indigenous knowledge to shape theory and practice of the broader profession including curriculum development and research, while it also, quote, 
serves the education of all learners who are citizens of countries where Indigenous peoples are the first peoples. <clears throat> I consider the hallmarks of the information science field, that is the collection, classification, storage, movements, retrieval, dissemination, and protection of information, and look at them from an Indigenous lens. For example, we can think about the collection of books and materials written by or about Native people, the classification of Indigenous knowledge, the storage, movement, and dissemination of Indigenous knowledge through information systems, and the mechanisms to protect or not protect Indigenous knowledge. When we look at the field through this lens, we can see that Native people have been creating, transmitting, categorizing and preserving knowledge since the beginning of time, always looking ahead to future generations while remembering the ancestors and generations that came before us. This is Indigenous knowledge organization, the methods and means by which Native and Indigenous people create protocols to cohere, name, articulate, collate, and make accessible the objects that indicate Indigenous knowledge. At the center of all these methods is relationality. Relationality is the core organizing principle when we're talking about that identification, creation, and continuation of indigenous systems of knowledge. So this means that we're respectful with the information that we gain from others and use this knowledge in a way that contributes to rather than extracts from indigenous communities. For instance, relational accountability can inform how data and data sets collected by and about Indigenous people is stored, disseminated, and accessed. It can guide library and archival practices like collection development and digitization of materials. It can guide knowledge organization practices. I'll come back to this idea of relationality in, in a moment. The framework that I'm going to share with you today is broadly influenced by Indigenous research methodologies, and I want to focus on two today. Uh, the first comes from uh, this book, uh, the, uh, and it's the Indigenous Research Agenda that's outlined in Linda Tuhiai Smith's landmark book, Decolonizing Methodologies that Centers Indigenous Self-Determination and Privileges Indigenous Knowledge, Voices, and Experiences. The Indigenous Research Agenda addresses decolonization, healing, mobilization, and transformation. It acknowledges the states of being that Indigenous communities are moving. The intentions of this research are to contribute to the survival of people, languages, social, and spiritual practices. This might mean the recovery of land, rights, and histories. It must be ethical, healing, transformative, and participatory. So I, like many uh, scholars around the world, have been deeply influenced by this work and I strive towards these goals. The second is indigenous, uh, is the indigenous research paradigm described by uh, Sean Wilson in 2008, where we consider the way that we view reality, ontology, how we think about or know about this reality, epistemology, our ethics and morals, axiology, and how we go about gaining more knowledge about reality, our methodology. Relationships form our realities and our ways of knowing. Knowledge is relational. It's important to be accountable to our relations, to be respectful with the knowledge that we gain from others, and to use this knowledge in a way that contributes to Indigenous communities rather than takes away. So based on this axiology, Indigenous research methodologies are designed to help build relationships, to be respectful to participants and to the topic, and to incorporate reciprocity. So the underlying assumption behind an Indigenous approach to research is that relational accountability. Um, and so you might ask yourself these questions, and we ask, I ask myself these questions all the time as I'm doing this work, and it informed the framework that I'm sharing. Um, how do my methods help build re respectful relationships um, with the topic that I'm studying and myself? How do my methods help build respectful relationships with um, myself, 
um, and research participants or with the ideas that I'm sharing? Um, how do I relate respectfully um, with the ideas and with the people that are involved so I can form stronger relationships? What's my role as a researcher or a practitioner? Um, and what are my responsibilities? Am I being a responsible uh, individual and fulfilling my role and obligations to this topic and to all of my relations? And what am I contributing or giving back in this relationship? Is the sharing, growth, and learning that's taking place reciprocal? So this brings me to the framework. Um, and I want to talk you through the process that got us uh, to this framework. As I mentioned previous, previously, this work is built on years of conversations within our own research group and with the scholarly literature. As Indigenous information scientists, we often draw upon terms like relationality, Indigenous ways of knowing, uh, expressions of Indigenous knowledge. We use these terms to describe our approaches to our work when we talk about the identification, discernment, creation, and continuation of Indigenous systems of knowledge. And while these concepts have uh, distinct definitions to, to us, to the unassuming ear, they can blend together, right? They can, they muddy the, those specific actions and outcomes that are important in the information science field. As scholars that are, who are familiar with the intellectual traditions of our ancestors and with the landscape of American Indian and indigenous studies literature, we turn to those who came before us to help guide our definitions. So we, li we, we relied on Cree scholar Sean Wilson for a definition of relationality. For the concept of holism, we looked to Joanne Archibald from the Stolo Nation in Canada. For indigenous ways of knowing, we looked to Kanika Malawi scholar uh, Manalanu uh, Meyer. And for expressions of indigenous knowledge, we looked to White Earth Chippewa and Choctaw scholar, Clara Sue Kidwell. The definitions we used are written here, um, presented in a linear fashion in separate boxes. And you can see the difference between this and um, the circular framework. So here you see Sean Wilson's definition of relationality, which is that acknowledgement that we all exist in relationship to each other, the natural world, ideas, the cosmos, objects, ancestors, and to future generations. And furthermore, that we are accountable to those relationships. Holism um, is that intellectual, uh, indigenous philosophical concept referring to the interrelatedness between the intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and physical realms to form a whole healthy person and also healthy communities. Indigenous ways of knowing are the activities that we do that create relationships and knowledge. So these are the ways that Native people have been creating, transmitting, categorizing, preserving knowledge since the beginning of time. These are the verbs, the things that we do, right? And from those things that we do, we get those expressions of Indigenous knowledge. Those are those discernible manifestations of knowledge, the tangible and intangible knowledge, like the stories, the art, documents, songs, tools, the nouns, the things that come out of our relationships and the, the activities that we do. Here's how Joanne Archibald of the Solo Nation depicted holism in her book, uh, Indigenous Story Work. We saw as authors, um, relationality and holism is very complementary in, in our work. And holism refers to that synergenic influence of and our responsibility towards generations of ancestors, generations of today and future generations. So it's about the health of a person, family, community, and tribal nation, and the responsibilities we have to each other to maintain that health in those four realms. We also incorporated the theoretical construct of peoplehood developed and refined by Tom Holm, Diane Pearson, and Ben Chavez in 2003. According to the peoplehood model, there are four aspects of peoplehood that are interwoven and dependent on each other. Language, sacred history, place or territory, and ceremonial cycle. 
So each of these four aspects of peoplehood supports a particular group's sense of identity and accounts for their relationships with each other and the world, as well as uh, their ways of knowing and their expressions of knowledge. Instead of arranging these concepts in a linear fashion, we wanted to create a visual uh, ontological tool to demonstrate how all of these concepts interact with each other, um, how they intersect and how they intersect with the information institutions. We wanted to depict relationality as the core organizing principle of this framework, literally centering relationality in our understanding of indigenous systems of knowledge in the context of information institutions as well as other uh, Western institutions. <clears throat> so the image here um, is somewhat a, a simplified model of indigenous systems of knowledge where the concepts of relationality, peoplehood, indigenous ways of knowing, expressions of indigenous knowledge, as well as the institutions on the outside and the values of respect, responsibility, and reciprocity are layered in the cyclical and interlaced structure. So the way you read this is you move from the center outward. Um, and as you move from the center outward, the components become more tangible, more visible. So you'll also note that there are no solid lines in this framework, indicating that the layers are not separate from each other that in fact, the layers interact with each other. They're all impacting each other, some with stronger waves than others. So I imagine this like a drop of water, right? That centers on relationality. And depending on how strong it is um, and how permeable the layers are, including into the institutions at the, at, on the outside, how strong that is and how, how much we allow that to go back and forth this will allow the energy of that relationality to be carried all the way into institutions. And if it's carried and treated with respect, that energy can be reciprocated and carried back into communities um, and to that source of relationality. So you start at the center with that concept of relationality and holism. Centering relationality means that we acknowledge the importance of relationships and relational accountability in our work. So next comes that con the context of peoplehood, right? Where we highlight those, those important relationships, specifically with language, sacred history, ceremonial cycle, and the continuous habitation within a place or territory, right? Those are the main things that we're exercising um, our relationality with, our relationships. So next are those, uh, is the indigenous ways of knowing those activities that we do within that peoplehood matrix that inform our systems of knowledge. So again, these are the, the ways that Native people have been creating, transmitting, categorizing, and preserving knowledge since the beginning of time. Again, these are the verbs. These are the things that we're doing. And then as we move out into the next layer, we see the results of those activities from below, the expressions of indigenous systems of knowledge the things that are coming out of those activities, right? The stories, art, documents, songs, tools, nouns, other things that, uh, that come out of those relationships. Um, and these are often the things that we hold or that we need to name or classify in our institutions. We wanted to convey that the information that we collect classify, store, access, retrieve, disseminate, and protect in our institutions doesn't have to be limited to the written word. As information scientists, we can explore the properties, behavior, and flow of indigenous knowledge that's expressed in material culture, like beadwork and pottery, as well as through those intangible expressions of knowledge, like dance, elders' teachings, and oral stories. Right, all of those things uh, fill in that that uh, expressions of knowledge. It's not limited to just the written word. And then on the outermost layer are the institutions, right? The libraries, the archives, higher education, schools, museums. Uh, it could also be tribal institutions, could be data repositories. Um, all of these things that might hold these expressions. <clears throat> 
a lot of times uh, we're hyper focused on just the outside layers, right? The institutions where we work um, and the things or the expressions of knowledge within them. But if you only focus on those layers, you miss out on the understanding of relationships and the activities that happen that inform those expressions. And then creating, cradling this entire system is um, this layer of uh, respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. This cradle ensures that the system stays intact and that our interactions are compassionate, loving, and caring because we're accountable to those with whom we relate. I designed this bottom piece of this uh, framework of respect, uh, responsibility, and reciprocity, thinking about the importance of cradle boards in my own community. Cradle boards protect our babies. Their construction is symbolic and intentional involving stories and ceremonies as they protect a child physically and also spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually. The Navajo, the Navajo Cradle Board, uh, which is pictured here, is alive with connections to the natural world, um, as well as to all of our relations as they protect and support current and future generations. Um, and this is a, a cradle board that's in my family. I'm aware that this model is new and that we still need to test it in various contexts and fields, which is why I'm excited to share this with you today. It's also a very academic approach to indigenous systems of knowledge. I recognize that um, if my parents or siblings were in this audience, they might wonder why I've spent the last uh, half hour uh, talking about um, you know, how our ancestors lived and you know, why have I spent so much, so much of my life, frankly, on this model um, this past couple of years that just describes the way that we live or that our ancestors lived, right? Um, so at least in my family, we don't sit around the kitchen table talking about relationality or indigenous ways of knowing. So I just wanna acknowledge that this is a very academic approach uh, that's meant to serve a larger purpose within institutional settings um, and also as an educational tool. I was excited um, to see this model featured in a viral TikTok video a few months ago where it had a lot of positive responses from, out, from outside of information science, um, including people who identified from fields like nursing and social work and higher ed, museum, uh, folklore, even an eighth grade teacher. Um, so if you want a 90 second version of this talk, uh, just look up uh, at Indigenous Librarian on TikTok, also known as Jesse Lawyer. I've given this um, talks on this model to librarians and archivists you know, interested in Indigenous approaches to cataloging and classification, as well as indigenizing their library. And I've used this model in several of my classes to demonstrate how, how to conceptualize uh, story work as a way of knowing in indigenous communities. I've used this framework to talk about protocols and ethics in research and the creation of digital projects. I've had colleagues at uh, my school and at other institutions use this model um, in their courses. I find that it's a handy uh, teaching tool to bridge our understandings of knowledge. I had one student uh, recently ask me what I would do differently if this framework, if I were to do it again, I thought that was a really brilliant question. One thing that I regret a little bit with this framework is that it might give the impression that these um, knowledge systems sit in this pristine condition, in this beautiful uh, bubble unmarked by colonization. And while we do address colonization um, in the article that I mentioned um, that accompanies this framework, uh, we don't have imagery to show that for many indigenous people, our relationships with land, language, ceremonial cycle, um, our hist and histories vary. Uh, for some people, the strongest relationship with these aspects of peoplehood reside with our ancestors. 
So still, I think this framework does a good job of visually depicting the important elements of indigenous systems of knowledge. So to conclude, um, I just ask you to, uh, to consider, you know, how do we represent and talk about the knowledge that's created by indigenous people in our, in, in our information systems and uh, institutions? We find that there are similarities and differences between the terms um, defining the kinds of knowledge that are created by indigenous people. These similarities and differences can be explained in part by their um, epistemic inclusion or exclusion of the dynamics of relationality as, there are, as these are enacted by indigenous people in the context of peoplehood. So this is a very generic framework, right? There are similarities and differences. And I'm not, uh, this isn't meant to represent all indigenous people but I think that this shows that there are those similarities and differences and that the center is, um, and that we have in common is that relationality. So how practitioners decide to use these ideas um, and terms um, will shape the capacity of, in, of institutions to engage in processes of reciprocity, responsibility, and respect. I believe that centering relationality is a decolonizing technique that allows indigenous ontologies to emerge in these otherwise colonial institutions. So with that, I welcome your ideas and questions, um, your thoughts on how you might see this framework um, useful in your work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions here, so I'll start with what's here, but I also encourage folks to uh, type additional questions uh, in the, um, into the questions box and we'll go through them. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Melissa Torres. Uh, in your work, have you struggled with institutions that perhaps treat this as an alternative system of knowledge? How can institutions stop conflating Western knowledge systems with normal and begin mm -hmm. to create equity between systems? Yeah. A big question for you. Good question. Um, I think we're at the beginning stages of getting people to, to talk about, um, to, to stop seeing you know, Western systems as the normal, right? And to like start to see these other ways of knowing. Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, but I, th I feel like there's, like I said, I think we're at a, a critical moment where there's enough of us talking about this and giving examples and showing the harms that's, that's happened, but also showing some alternatives, you know, ways of, of dealing with this knowledge and being respectful, um, you know, that I think that there are, there's a wave, there's a wave changing. Um, and I feel like, you know, at least in my work, you know, I, I work a lot with students, um, MLIS students. And so, you know, seeing them excited about these ways of knowing and, you know, is putting aside their own, you know, Western ways of thinking and thinking about other uh, other approaches to knowledge um, and very, being very open to that from the beginning, I think is going to help um, change policies. And I'm always telling them they're the future leaders, they're going to be making these policy decisions. Um, but I think the more that we talk about this and you know normalize these conversations, um, this is when changes start to happen. So it's, yeah, we're we're still in those spaces where we're still having to have those conversations and it's it's going to take a lot of time and allies that understand this. Um, this is actually my own question, uh, but kind of connects to your answer there in terms of practices, um, especially practices with either um, creating knowledge organization systems like metadata vocabularies, um, or in terms of creating metadata or um, classifying stuff, uh, do you, uh, are there particular sort of practices or methods that you see as um, 
more productive for kind of having those conversations or, um, and I know you talked about kind of your, your sort of methodological approach in general. And I think a lot of what you said in terms of method uh, isn't just about research method, but we can apply that as like descriptive methodologies as well. Uh, but basically like how do we realize accountability? How do we build respect, responsibility, uh, and reciprocity into our, our, into our metadata practices? Uh, are there particular ways we, we should be thinking and going about that work? Um, besides, you know, being aware of, of these issues, I think the more that you can build relationships with actual people that these impact, um, you know, the, the more immediate or, the, you know, the understandings of like why this is important and like how do we, um, you know, it's not just some theoretical native person that's going to be coming into these institutions, but actually like finding out like, you know, what are their experiences of, you know, seeing Indians of North America, for instance, or, you know, metadata that is wrong or, um, you know, erases people. Um, you know, if people can start building those relationships and realizing that we're there, <laughs> we're, we're users of these institutions, we're communities that are out there, you know, whether or not we're, um, you know, like I said, in that, that something else, you know, we're always kind of put in this category of, um, you know, not being very visible. Um, but realizing that we're there and, you know, if, if people are really interested in, um, you know, understanding how to make those changes, I think, you know, finding people that this is impacting may be one way to really, um, to make those changes. Um, but otherwise, you know, just knowing that, that, you know, these are important and, you know, consulting uh, Native people, if you can, uh, communities about changes or, um, you know, how you describe objects or uh, things within collections. Um, there's, it's not going to be an easy answer and there isn't always going to be a single answer or everyone's not going to agree, but I think just starting to ask, you know, just at least asking and, you know, realizing that we don't always have the answers, even myself, you know, um, there's communities of people that can help. Thank you. Uh, so this is a question from Rhiannon Bativia. Uh, she says, in terms of applications, I was wondering about a particular context, thinking about the need for description and metadata in global e-commerce spaces and the complex decisions that some indigenous groups make to sell craft goods in global markets. What this means when cultural practices get artificially fixed around an object that becomes a material good Mm -hmm. how this approach might be applied to enable indigenous groups to gain and maintain power and agency in commerce transactions uh, when people are selling products that represent cultural heritage. Um, she says, I'm thinking about work like that of Rad Radhika Gajala and Rastina Untari on Sumbanese weavers, for example. Uh, so, Kind of, yeah. a, kind of a long, kind of a big question there too. Uh, so, um, yeah, not. I have. But in really terms of right, bringing this into the commerce space and what that might mean. I guess it depends on you know who's who's doing the selling too. You know, are we talking about um, indigenous people selling their own goods or uh, non-indigenous people selling this these items? Um, and I'm sorry if I'm not gonna answer this question directly because I, I haven't really thought about this in terms of commerce or marketing, but um, you know, I think just being able to um, you know label their their knowledge or um, being free to um, to put on their own um, descriptions or you know how how they came uh, to this knowledge um, is important. So, you know, and just depending on, you know, whether it's an indigenous person 
marketing this or or not i think would would change my uh yeah, so so rihanna follows up and says she she's she's talking about indigenous people selling their own goods uh, and how to maintain agency uh, when they're doing that for financial survival yeah i think you know just being being free to to talk about you know our ways of knowing and and knowing that you don't have to always put everything out there too like there's uh, mechanisms to protect knowledge and you know we have that agency to to put out there you know what we want to put out there and, and now that we have that control and um, you know whether or not it's um, you know helpful for our own communities to be uh, transparent about everything right there's things that shouldn't be put out there right and so you know just having that agency to describe and um, maintain our our knowledge systems whether it's for educational purposes or for marketing or for our own you know income um, that we should feel um, that that uh, empowerment to uh, describe and label and protect our knowledge um, in ways that make sense for our own communities yeah, I think that's that seems particularly complex given the history of, of course, that not having that often not having been the case, right, in the collection of um, indigenous cultural heritage, right. Um, and I think this is perhaps what you were talking about with um, the the sort of invisible, like <clears throat> the role of uh, colonialism in your framework and how. Um, it's hard it's it's kind of at this point we can't disentangle what's happened in the past from how we're reacting to these systems now uh, and so um, I think right this idea of of agency um, does seem like a really critical aspect here yeah okay we have a this is uh, so uh, this is from Taylor Baker uh, thank you so much for this presentation this makes me think that this would require us to reimagine something foundational in metadata and cataloging as catering everything to who the users are of the collection. That is important in our work, but I think sometimes that can be at odds with respecting the relationality of the materials. So I think that's something perhaps you could uh, riff on or comment on. <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of times we get uh, caught up in that status quo or you know th these are the ways that it's always been done or you know these systems sometimes are just so large that it's even hard to even think about like changing things right and so um, you know taking the time to to think about those relationships it's I know there's <laughs> There's a lot of like bureaucratic processes even to change things. I've been working with uh, a student that's working on like Library of Congress, you know, changing you know subject headings, and that's just for one you know small thing. I know it's 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 a huge undertaking, right? And um, and doing all of that consulting to think about like how you would change a subject heading, um, and then that becomes a permanent thing, right? And what if that changes and 50 years or something. And so, you know, that we have these really inflexible systems um, doesn't help us in a lot of ways. And so, you know, I think about, um, yeah, like sometimes it's like these big big battles, you know, we have to be fighting. Um, sometimes it is about being more nimble and flexible in ways that, you know, that we can be um, making changes locally or, in smaller systems that may be able to like permeate into larger systems. Um, so there's all these like complexities happening with, with these um, historical ways of doing things, right? And so it's it's a huge issue. Um, but uh, you know, I think the more that we talk about it, like I said, you know, just start normalizing these conversations and realizing that there's, you know, there are problems and you know. And also the fact that these are human made, right? And they come from a place, they come from a time of, of thinking um, that we are 
we're smart and you know we've created systems before so why can't we try to try to do something different you know it's not like it's uh you know it's it's not impossible i would say and that's that's the whole reason why i'm doing this and why i teach and why I, you know do this research and do these presentations you know is to get us to think about like you know what are our roles and how do we uh, as in your own positions or your own positionality what can you what kind of influence can you have um, in these systems yeah so uh, we have a question from monica green um about this is related to what you were just saying about uh asking if you've worked at all with the Library of Congress or other institutions, um, uh, I know you've worked with in IFLA a bit uh, to bring awareness to indigenous metadata and these kinds of topics. I haven't worked um, <clears throat> directly with like Library of Congress. Um, I'd say more indirectly of you know people that that are working with those um, uh, with those systems. Um, and yeah, you know, IFLA, we are working on some like guidelines of like working with indigenous communities around the world. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of it is, um, uh, you know, challenging of thinking about globally, you know, indigenous people and the, the different issues that are happening um, here in the US, you know, issues of like, treaties and you know our own government uh, relationships with people um, and so you know having those understandings and um, I guess building the, that network network of allies of um, people that can understand these these systems um, to me is uh, has been my my approach <laughs> so far yeah in uh, in general do you think um that i guess you know there's kind of two well there's there's different ways to approach these things and you mentioned kind of working with smaller uh more local organizations uh, do you think that's um do you think that's possibly more productive than kind of going for the library of congress versus <laughs> kind of, so i know in 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 some of your previous work you've done uh, worked on kind of specializing classifications or vocabularies for particular groups do you think that um, that kind of more uh, bottom-up approach might be uh, has has those advantages i think it it does um you know the the advantage of that is being more specific and um you know having that local community uh, to be able to con continue that forward. The disadvantage of that is because it's so small and, you know, when people leave or, um, you know, you don't, people having to start over again, right, which is the case of that, the Mashantucket Pequot uh, thesaurus, right, of, um, you know, it, it never really got implemented because, you know, Cheryl Matoyer's, uh, you know, work there never really, it didn't get tested. Uh, they put a lot of work into, you know, creating this, but, you know, the next steps would be to to test it. Um, but it did make, you know, impacts on like the, you know, what we wrote about, of like the museum labels or getting people to rethink, you know, how they talk about the, the local tribal community. Um, so, you know, as far as, um, you know, I guess it just, it depends on your perspective on, you know, do we want to be making these smaller impacts with, you know, local communities? Do we need to be uh, looking at these broader um, systems? I think we need both. Um, and I think we need, um, you know, people that are well versed in, you know, that grassroots level and, you know, really familiar with their own communities and also people who are really familiar with these bigger systems, you know, Library of Congress or, you know, these metadata standards, um, uh, people like, um, uh, like Kim Christian, right, that's doing like the Mukutu, you know, creating these other systems and uh, traditional knowledge labels. 
um, to help us, you know, rethink, you know, how we deal with knowledge in different ways. Sorry, my dog is starting to bark. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Uh, I love um, So Kathleen Sullivan asks if there are examples of Western libraries or institutions that have made a promising start at adapting their practices uh, to better reflect respect, responsibility, and reciprocity or other aspects of the framework. I always point to the WIPA library um, in uh, British Columbia, the University of British Columbia, as an example that's, um, you know, it's an indigenous library on the campus of the University of British Columbia that's using the brain deer classification system, right? And, and you go there and, you know, everything is organized in that way. And that, to me, that's just a, a great, example of like a western institution that you know has a whole library that's been organized and that's serving you know the purpose of a indigenous you know research and students and faculty um, you don't see that a lot um, in other communities um, you know we have examples i think canada um, you know new zealand australia uh, we have tribal colleges um, we have, uh, you know, special collections, um, you know, people that are uh, doing this work within their own institutions that are, you know, smaller um, collections that I think are, are designed to help um, give better access um, and description of these materials. Great. Uh, oh, the, the name is the, the Weewa Library. Someone just asked, can you say that again? Uh, so maybe. <laughs> and then uh, we can put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it uses numbers and letters, and uh, but it's a beautiful library. Yeah. If I can. Uh, here. Ah, some, someone else found it for me. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, there it is. So I can put it in the chat to everyone. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it starts with an X. Yeah. <clears throat> there it is. And that's pronounced uh, the Weewa Library. Weewa. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, a, it's pretty famous, I think, um, uh, for... For, for being kind of an exemplar of sort of an uh, a library that follows indigenous knowledge organization, I think, mm -hmm. um, kind of at and hosted, kind of located in a um, larger university context, which I think, you know, you mentioned kind of tribal colleges. Um, do you have a sense of uh, if, like the use of Brian Deere classification is pretty common in tribal colleges, or do they tend to revert to the? I think they're the yeah. Library of Congress, or yeah, I think they're you know tending to use the Library of Congress um, system. Although I know um, uh, the library in Michigan, which is totally blanking on. Um, they're looking at, you know, redoing their their systems. There's, you know, places that are that are working on this and writing grants. And um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a you know library in uh, Hawaii, you know, doing IMLS uh, grant funded work to rethink their knowledge organization systems. Um, so it's, you know, it's happening in these little these pockets. And maybe I should have given some examples of that. Yeah. Okay, well, we're just about at time here. So thank you everyone uh, for your great questions and uh, for joining us for our webinar. And I'd like to thank again, Dr. Sandy Littletree for joining us to talk about this topic. Uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, so you can get back to your dog there. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you again. Uh, and thank you to ACIST for hosting us today. Um, the recording of this will be available through the, uh, for
ACES members through the portal, and it will also be available uh, on the Dublin Core uh, website. So uh, stay tuned, everyone. So thank you again. Uh, and thank you. We will sign off. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Karen. I'd like to thank Dr. Sandy Littletree for presenting this very informative webinar. I also want to thank Karen Wicket for moderating the session. I want to remind attendees that one of your many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all webinars. A recording of today's webinar and copy of this um, will be given to ACES members and registrants um, tomorrow. Within 24 hours, attendees will receive an email with a recording of the webinar and a survey. I encourage you to complete it within seven days. Again, I'm Aminta Dawson with ACES staff, and I thank you for attending today's webinar. This, this concludes the session. Thank you. <laughs>